Uh, rolling. Oh, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Okay. I'm Liv, we're a very prestigious guitar player, to say. Um, this new album, The Yellow Jackets, um, how, did, how did you contribute to the, to the album? You know, they describe it as not technically a member, but it's very right. cool. You contribute a lot. Well, uh, I'm actually not uh, in, in the writing of the material. I wasn't uh, a big contributor on this particular record. But um, the group's been together for a couple of years, and so, you know, it's like, uh, it's a four-man team, and everybody puts in as much as everybody else, and that's really pretty true in this band, which is great. Uh, everybody participates in the arrangements and the writing. I did some co-writing on the record, and that's the basic format. So. Um, tell me more about the history of the band. Um, from talking to the other two members, uh, apparently you had them on your solo album and you guys really hit it off. Yeah. How did, how did it uh, progress from that point? It was actually, um, the, the group had never performed live as a whole at the time that we did the album. and had recently sort of formed, although the keyboard player and I had been playing together off and on for years. And uh, when we went into the studio, I actually, uh, Steve Cropper produced the record. And in talking about it and uh, conceptualizing the whole thing, we had various studio musicians that we thought we might bring in. John Guerin came in to play on some of it, and uh, Tower of Powers drummer at the time came in and played. Uh, James Jamerson Jr., bass player, came in to play on it. But like, whenever we used anybody else outside the quartet, it just did not happen. And uh, we worked for hours on a tune one night using a different drummer, and. Uh, by the end of the evening, it was like, well, you know, I, we've got what we've got, and the drummer split, and Ricky was there all night long just sitting and watching. And uh, somebody said, I think my producer probably said, for the hell though, why don't we try it with Ricky? Ricky had been listening to the tune all night, so he knew it cold, went in, and it was just like, boom, everything was happening, the band sounded great, we, uh, we got it in two takes, after having spent like six hours on it with different players. And... Uh, so it's like, you know, hey, this is something. But uh, everybody had gigs with different people. I think uh, Jimmy went out with Dave Mason, and uh, Ricky was uh, with George Duke, and uh, Russell and I were in town doing, you know, various club gigs, studio gigs, etc. And so the band never actually started playing live together until just before the Yellow Jackets thing actually came together and uh, decided to shop a deal with it and everything, and got a deal. Okay. And record. Record sounds great. Thanks. It. Yeah, it's good. Uh, let's go back in time a little bit. Um, you've been played with probably most of the major artists, in my mind, you know, that are around right now. How'd you get involved with uh, the LA Express and Tom Scott? Well, so it was sheer out of the blue to me. Uh, I was working with Jimmy Witherspoon, blues singer, and uh, I was heard by them, uh, let's see, actually not Tom, uh, the bass player, Max Bennett, heard me playing with, uh, at a, a jazz festival. No, wait a minute, no, he, he heard me playing with Spoon at Dante's, we used to play Dante's often in LA, and uh, the keyboard player heard me at a jazz festival that I was a featured guitarist, guitarist at, uh, Monterey Jazz Festival. So uh, they told Tom about me, just as uh, the group was getting together to go on the road with Joni. And uh, Larry Carlton and Joe Sample, who'd been the guitarist and keyboard player for the, the record, Court and Spark, uh, but they couldn't go out because of their commitments with the Crusaders. So they went looking for a keyboard player and a guitar player. So they had me down, and uh, Tom called me up on the phone the same day that I had flown to Los Angeles to leave Witherspoon because I was sort of, you know, I was ready to go. I'd been working with him for a couple of years and had some music I'd been working on, thought I'd like to explore. And uh, I was down at the office waiting for Witherspoon to, to come in. And I got a call from Tom Scott saying, you know, how'd you like to go out on the road with uh, Joni Mitchell? And I was like, I mean, I was like, I'd never done anything like that before. And... Is that noise? Um, 
Yes, sir. <coughs> Ready, Frank? Ready? Yeah. Make it, man. <laughs> Do you see um, jazz is becoming more of a more of a mainstream kind of music type of music now rather than uh, before it was more restricted now after say Joni Mitchell and Spyro Jar kind of just made it more pop or made it brought it into the mainstream more? What do you mean? Uh, oh, has jazz become more mainstream? Yeah. Uh, yeah, to to an extent. Uh, to me, jazz like the epitome, the the most what I would call jazz. Best record I ever heard. Uh, actually, two records came out of a live concert by Miles Davis's group. Miles Davis, George Coleman on tenor sax, Herbie Hancock acoustic piano, Ron Carter acoustic bass, and Tony Williams on drums. Tony Williams is probably eighteen, and. Uh, those records were done, I believe, in the 50s, maybe even early 60s, 63, something like that. Um, they were playing Standards, My Funny Valentine, Stella by Starlight, uh, All the Things You Are, you know, these standard tunes. And, uh, but it was so energetic and at the same time so modern and hip, uh, all acoustic instruments. Now, you don't hear a whole lot of that anymore. Uh, a group playing jazz with that much conviction, energy, freshness, I mean really, uh, that group is to me, is a kick is kicking is what the Yellow Jackets is doing and we're doing, uh, what we're doing is like with amplifiers and uh, you know, <laughs> kind of loud guitar, these guys were doing it, it was as kicking as that. Um, we did the Montreux Jazz Festival this past, past summer and uh, Chick Corea came out, uh, played all acoustic piano. Uh, Roy Haynes, who's uh, probably in his late 40s, jazz drummer, great musician. Gary Peacock uh, and Joe Henderson, who's one of the great jazz tenor players of all time. And uh, they were doing the same thing, only even more modern. I mean, Chick is just so far out, <laughs> can be so far out. Now, you don't hear too much of that in uh, in what you know is like considered fusion these days. Weather Report does it somewhat. So, so I guess it sort of depends on how you look at it. You could say, I mean, jazz influences exist in all kinds of you know modern music, contemporary music. Uh, it's hard to say that jazz has become more mainstream. I don't know. Maybe it's just like putting it a different way or something. Jazz has infiltrated more people's lives probably m without them knowing it or something you know what I mean without going out after jazz uh, people who are playing more rock and popular oriented music have brought it into their music so. All right, it's affected more musics rather than yeah but jazz. but the people who are hearing that stuff don't necessarily you know they've never heard those uh, Miles Davis records or they don't even know what an Ornette Coleman is or you know <laughs> so it's so, kind of a jazzy sound to it rather than... It's, it's got the sophistication of jazz, the, the harmonic quality, the melodic yeah. quality, great chops. That's one thing. Uh, people are better players than they used to be, technically. So jazz is influenced by more, more mainstream music or something. Um, how do you see video is, is playing uh, more of a major part in music these days or in the future? Boy. Well, video seems to be the means to get to the public these days. Music, musicians uh, don't go on the road as much as they used to because uh, you know the dire straits of the music industry and it's so expensive that nobody can afford to go on the road. So video is a less expensive way of getting yourself out across the whole world. So that's it. What um, other contemporary guitarists do you, do you consider? Of a, what can I say, high caliber. What 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 other guitarists do you like to listen to? Um, let's see. For some reason, I always find that a difficult question. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure really why, cool. really. Uh, uh, guitar players that I have enjoyed listening to uh, over the past few years, Eric Gale, I think is great. I I like to li when I want to listen to a guitar player. I like to listen to uh, blues-influenced players more so than uh, uh, 
necessarily jazz-oriented players or whatever. Uh, and I always have a hard time coming up with names. Uh, I, John McLaughlin is an, you know, an incredible guitar player, but I don't buy his records and I don't listen to him at home or anything like that. Uh, you just enjoy blues. I like to, 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 to listen to guitar, yeah. yeah. And um, Ted Green <coughs> is, uh, do you know who he is? Yeah, I do. A friend of mine, it's his uh, I think cousin, or he's oh, related really? to him. Yeah, John Green is his name. Far out. Yeah. That's Ted a, that's plays with both hands uh -huh. and yeah. sounds like four guitar I've players playing at yeah. once. Yeah. If I want to listen to, to a guitar and really be like blown away, really? I would put on Ted Green. And that's him. He's all by himself, right? And he's playing standards. He's playing yeah. uh, Swanee River. I mean, anything. And he just makes it so gorgeous. So I just kind of. To listen to players, I like. I just like to to enjoy it, uh -huh. and uh, don't too much listen to guitarists for ideas. Particularly, it's more more for enjoyment or something like that. Uh -huh. I like to put on BB King record or Robert Johnson. Yep. All right, All right. slide right. blues right. guitar. Right. Great. Um, how did you uh, change from the, the situation where you're in a band like the LA Express? How did you go? more of a solo direction. How did, how did that come about? Well, it was something that I'd always wanted to do and uh, used to do before joining the LA Express and getting involved in that whole scene. So I'd always written quite a bit of music and played my own music with bands and it was very natural, very natural thing to do. And uh, in fact, Electro Asylum made it easy for me when they... Uh, it's not uh, something about the Electro Asylum made, made it easy for me. Uh -huh. Are we rolling? Yeah. Okay. Um, when I was working with uh, Joni Mitchell and the LA Express and uh, doing some touring, the uh, head of uh, Electro Asylum heard me with, uh, with Joan and uh, offered me a record deal, which that other record, uh, the, my first record, uh, evolved out of that. So it's like after all that stuff finished, it fell right into a, a record and uh, got the group together and did the record.